who am I? I'm me. So <laughs> stupid. And I just thought it was great. How many times am I gonna say I thought it was great? I feel like every book I've talked about today, I'm like, I thought it was great. See, here's the thing. I wanna make sure I'm not <laughs> saying too much. <laughs> they ran out of room on the title page, so it's supposed to be mental health, but it says mental heal. Oh my goodness. Hi everybody, it's Audrey, and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be my November wrap up and we are gonna do the thing where I break this up into two parts because despite the fact that I, I'm gonna say it, the worst reading slump of the year, I couldn't connect with the book to save my life. I participated in and completed National Novel Writing Month. I ended at like 52,000 words, so the goal is 50,000. I wrote every single day. Some days I only wrote like 150 words, but I did the writing and I still managed to read books. So we're gonna do this in two parts so that we're not here all day, and today is part one. Okay, so first up, we are gonna talk about the last book I read in October that I completely forgot I read in October, and I never mentioned to you guys. So it's a super short audiobook. It's like a three-hour audiobook. I was looking for something kind of spooky, and it is Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. So I had a great time with this. It's a little bit horror -y, it's a little bit mystery, and this is about a group of kids, so it's one last laugh for the summer, and it says, we thought we'd play a fun prank on her, and now most of us are dead. One last prank to scare a friend. Bringing a mannequin into a theater is just some harmless fun, right? Until it wakes up, until it starts killing. So I did not know what to expect going into this book. I listened to it in one fell swoop, I was hooked. It didn't scare me to death. I wasn't quite sure what was happening here. It's definitely kind of dark and messed up and I enjoyed it. So that was my introduction to Stephen Graham Jones. I'm still interested in My Heart is Chainsaw and I saw that he has a sequel coming out for that too. So he's definitely still on my radar, but that was how I ended October, got my last spooky vibe in before Halloween and I never mentioned it to you guys. Okay, so now it's November and I don't know what happened but I could not connect with a book. I couldn't get my attention focused. I was getting distracted by things. Nothing appealed to me. So here we go. I have soft DNF'd a couple of books. So I was in the midst of reading Chasing the Boogeyman by Richard Chismar. And I am so committed because when I read a book, I take the cover off. I have not put the covers back on these books because I'm going back to them. And I was, let me see, 81 pages into this book. And I was really enjoying it but this is a true crime fiction. So Richard Chismar does a self insert in this book. He flashes back to a real point in his life and then creates murders in his hometown. And there's the true crime feel to it. There's a bit of a meta feel to it. And I was really enjoying it. And the problem with this one, problem, is that I am writing a book that has a true crime element to it and I was getting too confused slash distracted. I could not, not that I couldn't separate what was in the book and what was in my book, but I was, I, I can't, I can't read what I'm writing. I can't write what I'm reading and I needed to just put pause on this. So I will go back to it, but I just felt like, it felt like it was gonna unintentionally influence thoughts of mine about what I was writing and I don't want that to happen. And then, I tried a couple tried chapters. I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. I didn't, I'm not even gonna bother wasting your time talking about the ones I tried a chapter on because some of them I read like the first page and I was like, nope, nope, nope. And then towards the end of the month, I picked up a book that I was so jazzed to read and it's Angeline Bully's Firekeeper's Daughter. And I got part way into it. This book is gigantic guys. So I feel like it looks like I read seven pages of this book. I read 53 pages of this book. It is 493 pages and I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate. There's so much to this. There's so many characters, there's so much going on. There's so much depth to this book. I could not keep my brain focused on this. I needed something that I could dip in and out of. I needed something that didn't require a ton, ton of my brain power. 
I needed something that would allow me to just read for a little bit before bed, but I could still focus on my writing and other things. And I don't want to do this book a disservice by half-assing it. So I am soft DNFing this one as well for when my brain is a little bit less foggy and when I can actually commit to focusing on the book. So the third one, which I soft DNF'd in October because I couldn't read two sort of dark and messed up thrillers at the same time, which I realize sounds crazy for me, but it's Saw Kill Girls by Claire Legrand. And then I was like, oh, I'll pick it up in November. And I didn't. So I'm still at page 153 on this one. I'm going to go back to this one. I was very much enjoying it, but it just was not what I needed at the time. And it just wasn't, it wasn't working for me. So I'm going to go back to that one too. So three DNFs, November was like my worst month but then wound up, being, wound, up being, wound up being pretty great. Here we go. <laughs> the first book I actually got through, which was a wonderful one hour and 41 minute audiobook of self-help, and it's called 101 Ways to Be Less Stressed, Simple Self-Care Strategies to Boost Your Mind, Mood, and Mental Health. And this is by Dr. Caroline Leaf. So I did the audiobook of this through my library, and it just worked for me. It is legit a list of 101 things to do. And it is everything from like taking a bath and like all the things you can do. I listened to it twice on two different walks. It was just like a running therapy, this and this and this and this, and it just connected with me and it calmed me down. It was nothing I hadn't heard before, but once again, packaged in a way that it actually hit home with me and I totally enjoyed it. It was easy breezy. It's the kind of book that I debate picking up a hard copy of so that I can go back and read it when I want it. But it talks about just whether it's, you know, healthy eating or exercising or self care and like things that you can do to just take care of yourself and hopefully little things that can help make you feel better in the short term and can compound into the long term. So I very much enjoyed it. Like I said, easy breezy. That was the first book under my belt and it got me to a slow start of getting out of my slump. Okay, let's talk about my infamous spoiled book, Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. So if you guys saw my discussion video a couple weeks ago about when reviewers spoil books, you would hear me talk about this one. And I was in such a state when I made that video. So I will link it for you guys in case you didn't get to see it, but long story short, I was talking about how I'm noticing more and more on booktube and bookstagram that when people are reviewing books or talking about books or just doing their stories or making comments and stuff people are spoiling either minor or major parts of books which directly impacts the reading experience for other people and not in my opinion in a good way so i don't think people are doing it intentionally but i was in the massive reading slump i was coming out of it this book was my gateway out of the slump and I was cruising Instagram and one of my favorite bookstagrammers spoiled the twist of this book in a comment they made in their stories and I was mad but I'm not holding it against the book I've had a few weeks to process and ultimately I enjoyed the book even knowing what happened and I definitely think I would have enjoyed it more not having known, but it was a well done book. It was a well done twist. It's great writing. I stand by what I said in my first video. Don't even read this because it's too much. So basically I'm going to give you the psychotic cliff notes version of what you need to know about this book. So this is a book about a woman named Florence and she works in the publishing industry in New York. She's super low level and she winds up leaving that job and working as a personal assistant for a famous author and things ensue. That's basically what you need to know. So it's twisty. You've got complicated relationships. They are in New York. They are in Morocco. It's very atmospheric. I've never been to Morocco, but man, did it feel like I was there. I feel like she painted such a perfect picture of what life was like there. I was guessing about things. I wasn't sure about people. I wasn't sure who to trust. I wasn't sure what was going to happen in the end. And I really, really enjoyed it. So this is another debut author. This is another debut novel. 
And when I say this ripped me out of my reading slump, no joke, you guys. This is the kind of book you can devour super quickly, but it was just so well done. And I was completely pulled in from the beginning. And I was so curious to find out what was going to happen. <laughs> when I found out what was gonna happen. But still, I there I didn't know the complete ending. I didn't know sort of like the final beat of the book. And I really like what the author did with this. I liked the way the story went. I like what she did with her characters and I was in for it. So she is definitely going to be an author that I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for, for what she comes up with next. But whether or not you're in a reading slump, I hugely highly recommend this book. I'd heard such great things about it. And like I said in that last video, I felt like I'd been saving it for a special day and I didn't know what that was. And when I was in the slump and I was like, I'm gonna do this and ah, oh, it worked. It absolutely worked. Loved this book. Next up is Not a Happy Family by Sherry LaPena. And this was gifted to me by Christine, who was one of my subscribers for my birthday last month. So thank you so much. I do love me a Sherry LaPena book. And this is domestic suspense, rich people behaving badly, suburban, psychological thriller mystery with a little police investigation, little knives out vibes. And I was here for it. I was absolutely here for it. So this is about the Merton family and our matriarch patriarch, we have Sheila and Fred Merton and they live in Brecon Hill in upstate New York, which is an expensive place to live. They are worth quite a bit of money. So this book opens on Easter Sunday and they are having their three adult children over for Easter Sunday dinner and their spouses and partners come with them and everybody goes home for the night and then the next day we find out that Fred and Sheila have been brutally murdered in their home that Sunday night. And understandably, the children are devastated. It's like dot, dot, dot. Or are they? Because they all stand to inherit a ton of money. They all could use it slash want it. They all have motives for murder. And the police investigation is underway. I was gonna say underfoot, that's not right, underway. And it has sort of that very, knives outish feel in the way of not that a stranger got the money but that the wealthy people are murdered and the police are looking at the children to wonder who done it and they start looking into it so we've got a ton of characters we have a ton of motives this is small town we have family we have different connections to things lots of secrets lots of motives happening here and we have a very significant character which i mean like is a main character in the book named audrey which i always love because it doesn't really happen very often peter swanson did it in one of his books set in boston <laughs> I just really enjoyed it. I feel like when I read a Sherry LaPena book, I know what I'm going to get. I enjoy the rich people behaving badly stuff. I like the police detective, but then even the siblings don't know if they can trust each other. And there's just some, you know, some history going on there. And it's not these perfect relationships and it's not this perfect family. And I just love the like, everybody's a suspect kind of a feeling. So I, very much enjoyed this book. It definitely scratched an itch. This was after I read Maud Dixon, which is the book that got me out of the slump. So I was riding high and I was feeling good about it. So thank you again, Christine, for sending this to me. This was Sherry LaPena's new book that came out in 2021. And I really, really enjoyed it. So fun times. I always love me some suburban New York. This is set in like another fictional place kind of like We Are the Brennans, where that was set, that same Hudson Valley part of New York, which incidentally also part of Maud Dixon is set in Hudson Valley in New York. So I am here for all the New Yorkish type of stuff going on. But if you're a fan of Sherry LaPena, I would say it is definitely on brand for her. And I mean that in the best way. And I like the twist and turns. I had some suspicions about some things, you know, I was looking for the motives and the who could have done it and all of that. And I liked the ending and I just had a fun time with it. So definitely a good fun, sort of that popcorn read to use that phrase. And I thought it was great. So the next book I wanna talk about is The Ivies by Alexa Dunn. And this is my complicated feelings book of the month. So not quite as complicated as I felt about The Maidens last month, but I went into this with such high expectations. And I would say ultimately it was probably a three for me. And I watched a spoiler YouTube video that Alexa Dunn did after I read the book. And listening to some of her context makes me like some things more because she talked about sort of her 
authorial intent, intent when she was writing it and what she was trying to do with the characters. So then I was kind of like, oh, okay. And I'm going to actually needle off the record for a second here. I feel like it's the kind of thing that I criticized other people when they talked about books like The Maidens or um, Survive the Night by Riley Sager and were like, the things that character did didn't make sense or that felt very tropey or stereotypical or I didn't buy this. So I feel like when I was just like, let that all go, wash that away from your brain, take it for what it is. This is what this character does in this book, in this situation, it's not about you. There was stuff in this book where I was just like, that feels tropey and I'm not buying it. And why would somebody do that? So I was doing the same thing, but this is a YA mystery. I would say more mystery than thriller. And it's about a girl named Olivia. So she goes to this prep school and she's part of this clique of girls called the Ivies, which are five girls who are intent on going to an Ivy League college. And basically it says they will kill to get in is the, the tagline of this one. And I thought this was going to be about them doing all the bad things to sort of eliminate the competition and get into the school. But it actually opens when people are getting their admissions letters and that's when chaos ensues. So I went into it with the wrong perspective. And then we sort of in hindsight hear about some of the things the girls did, but it didn't seem as bad since we weren't living it as it happened. Like it was all in retrospect or in, in story or in second hand and just in a retelling of it. So I wasn't feeling that tension. And I think for me, what was missing from this book was the tension. So when I think about books like the Truly Devious series or the Holmes and Watson retelling by Brittany Cavallaro, not even a retelling, but the reimagining with Brittany Cavallaro or by Brittany Cavallaro and the Inheritance Games, I really feel sort of fast paced and tension and going and I'm in it. Whereas this, I expected it to be more mean girls pll just sort of like dark and disturbing teenagers being dark and messed up people to each other which i love and it was not as dark and messed up as i wanted it to be and it felt sort of more it was like it was mystery light but there is an incredible amount of cursing in this which i obviously don't care about the cursing but it didn't feel like it wasn't as dark as a Sadie or a Kara Thomas book where it seemed like the cursing and all the darkness would go hand in hand. So it sort of felt like a lighter book, but was trying to be edgy and I wasn't buying the edge in it. I really did like our mean girl Avery in this. And this was one of those books where I also feel like we get the entire book from Olivia's perspective. So Olivia is the scholarship girl. She's the odd girl out, but when she transfers to this school, Claflin Academy, she gets brought in by the queen bee. Avery and it was one of those things where I kind of was like why would they be friends with this girl and then I also sort of wondered why would Olivia be friends with them because she didn't really seem to like them all that much so I wasn't fully buying the friendship and we again only see it from Olivia's perspective so I think this book could have been more interesting if there was another perspective to it too so we only got sort of the odd girl out, outsider perspective to things. But I was really super interested in Avery and her story. And I did like her evil, evil like mom that would come in and just be like a horrible human being. So I enjoyed elements of it. But again, ultimately it just didn't totally scratch the itch I had. It didn't have the tension I wanted. And I think another thing, and it's funny, Alexa talked about this on the spoiler of this book on her channel. So she has an author tube channel. She has over a hundred thousand followers at this stage. I've been watching her for quite a long time. So this is her third book, but her first YA thriller. She has another one coming out next year. And she talks a lot about writing advice and her journey and the publishing industry. And I find her information and guidance really interesting on her channel and very helpful. But she talks a lot about, she doesn't follow Save the Cat, but she talks a lot about the twists and you know creating tension and pulling the rug out from people and things that she does in her book so it was almost like you could see some things coming because i followed her journey of writing this book because she vlogged drafting it and editing it and she didn't give away spoilers but the way she talks about how to sort of increase tension and how to write thrillers 
there was almost some giveaways because she talks so in depth about the writing process, which I love, but she's also a fellow BU graduate. We did not know each other at school because she went there far after I did, but there were a couple BU little nuggets in here, like Claflin University is the name of a dorm in West Campus. So I liked it. It has a very cool cover on it. I will continue to follow her and I'm curious to read her book for next year, her book that comes out next year. But again, this one didn't, it just wasn't quite as, I just wanted it to be darker. And I understand like with YA, not everything, I feel like there's so many YA books that go a little bit further and have an appeal to an adult audience. And then there are some that are firmly grounded in YA. And this straddled it in a strange way, but the story wasn't dark enough for me and I didn't need the cursing. Like I think it could have been the mystery as it was without the cursing, like the inheritance game. There's not cursing in that. Or give me some dark and messed up and then let's get edgy and gritty and do all the things. But it was trying to do a little bit of both. So I don't know, it was, it was fine, it was fine. So that's gonna do it for part one. Let me know if you guys have read any of these books. I hope nobody suffered from a slump. Let me know if anyone out here did National Novel Writing Month, and if you did, congratulations on doing it. I have, it's been a long time since I have ended a National Novel Writing Month feeling as good and inspired about my writing as I did this year. It's exactly what I needed. I did take December 1st off, but I have written every day since then. It's December 4th, but still I'm counting it. And I'm in the groove. I'm gonna write till I write those words, the end. And I am a thousand percent figuring things out as I go, which is how I tend to write. I'm the discovery writer, but I am so excited that I read some amazing books, that I am in it with the writing. And this month, which started off so horrible, <laughs> just ended on such a high. So I'm jazzed about that. So thank you guys so much for watching and hanging out today and tune in for part two when it's up because it'll be up when it's up and I will talk to you guys later. So take care guys. Bye.